Welcome to Terrifying and Twisted. Do you want a brew? Bonjour. <laughs> All right. All right. You suddenly turned French. Why fucking not? Fuck it. Can be whatever I want to be. This is, this is true. It's 2022. So anyway, we're back. Hi. How's everyone been? Obviously we're late again. <sighs> yeah. But I just wanted to say, obviously, me and Carla aren't professional. We've got a manic life with three kids, two dogs, blah, 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 blah. You don't need to hear a sub story, but people know that life happens and sometimes, sometimes things get pushed back. And there's been times where we've had time to record, but, you know, it hasn't been a great day. So we don't like to... None of us, what? We don't like to record when we've had a shit day because I think it would come across It as... comes across as shit. You can tell. I remember yeah. us once trying to do an episode um, and both of us were just like, what the fuck is wrong? We had no conversation between us. It was shit. So there's no point trying to record. And you're already put up with... Uh... Your bullshit. <clears throat> I was going to say your bullshit, but... You've got some fucking nerve. But we hope you've missed us. And if not, never mind. We're here anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're here. So I'll give you some uh, recommendations for the TV. I'll go through them quite quickly because there's quite a lot. So we've got Trigger Point ITV. Yeah, there were loads of bad reviews on it, weren't there? And me and you weren't sure what we were going to do, whether we even fancied it. It were okay, 6 out of 10. Yeah, I wouldn't rave about it. It were all right. Yeah. Then next we've got No Return on ITV. That was the Sheridan Smith. Yes, it was. I thought they were all right, to be honest. Mm, six out of ten. Uh, next, we've got Palmer. We're just in Timberlake. We watched that on Apple TV. Yeah, we did. Film. Yeah. But we're all right. Uh, I watched um, a German series called The Pass on Atlantic. That's about serial killers. Worth watch. I'd say nearly an eight out of ten. Uh, next, Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake on Netflix. <laughs> um, less said that about that, the better. Uh, next, Yellow Jackets on Sky Atlantic. It's got Juliette Lewis in. Um, if you've seen The Wilds on uh, on uh, Amazon Prime and you liked that, you'll like Yellow Jackets. It's quite high school girly that have been trapped on an island. Um... Probably a six out of ten. Next, we watched Our House on ITV. Yeah. With Martin Compton. That were difficult. Yeah, four episodes, ITV. I do recommend it. It were really good. But Eight to, out of ten. But to watch him play a completely different character. We were watching Gogglebox last night, weren't we? And we absolutely adore Giles and Mary. Yeah. And she said exactly the same, didn't she? Yeah. So, give it a watch. It is worth it. Uh, if anyone's into Vikings, Vikings Valhalla is on Netflix. I've finished that. It were always going to be difficult to watch that after watching Vikings. But it is only its first series, so... Worth watching. Next, we're still in the middle of Pieces of Her on Netflix. I think yeah. we're about halfway through. So, so far, so good on that. Yeah, we're enjoying that. I watched... Uh, we Are All Dead on Netflix, the zombie series. <laughs> I do recommend that. 7 out of 10. And for the last one, I've got See No Evil, Hear No Evil. Oh, we enjoy well, I, I'd never seen it, so... An oldie but a goldie. There's a running joke, I'm shit with films. I never will want to sit and watch them, so everyone takes piss that I haven't seen classics. So that's our rule, isn't it? Saturday night yeah. is a film night and Phil gets to choose a classic that I've not watched so yeah I really enjoyed that and then um, we also watched a little bit uh, cringy TV oh yeah we did Love, Love is, is Blind, Blind. <laughs> we'd never watched we didn't watch first series did we no. and we, jumped, we thought oh, we'll give it a go 
and actually we enjoyed it. It were all right. It's all right. I've I've watched worse. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Um, so it's me first. Do you want me to dive straight in? Crack on. <laughs> Scrolling Facebook as you do, and I come across an article. Now, if I give you this scenario, imagine you've moved into a new home. You settled in your new home. You like your new home, and one of your mates drops you a message and says, "I think you should watch this." So you put this program on. It's a documentary on a serial killer. And imagine being sat in your living room to then see your house on that programme. <laughs> That's how I came about this case. So I'm going to take you all the way back to April 1st, 2001. A female body is found in Washington Park. 15th of May, 2001. A female body is found in Alton Park. 30th of May, 2001. A female body is found in the back of an alley in St. Louis. 13th of June in St. Charles Sheriff's Office is called in um, to Missouri, Missouri State Highway to investigate a decomposed body. 29th of June, another female body is found in West Alton Park. 25th of August, another in St. Louis. 8th of October, another in St. Louis. 30th of January 2002, remains have been found. 11th of March. This is a lot. More remains are found. And then on the 28th of March 2002, more female remains are found. So, all these bodies were found dumped, naked and strangled to death. I'm going to introduce you to Murray Troy Travis. Why is it coming? Is Fuck it coming you. To our house or something? No, that would be impossible. Why were you introducing me to him? Because I'm going to tell you about him. So tell me about him. I don't need to be introduced. Grow up. <laughs> so, Murray Travis was also known as Toby to some people. He was born in St. Louis to his parents, Michael and Sandra. When looking into his background, which always makes these sort of cases harder in like my opinion he had a completely normal upbringing no sort of trauma no abuse no violence really really good upbringing up until his mum and dad got divorced he grew up living in a public housing complex just northwest of down street st louis and then the move to like this ranch style home in ferguson like i've just said his parents got divorced and his mum did remarry, but again, later got divorced in 1993. Neighbours always described him as polite and respectful, often cut people's gardens without being asked, doing odd jobs in neighbourhood. Did he get paid to cut this fucking did grass? Did he fuck? This were a different time, Philly. Who the fuck does gardening for free? You for fucking don't else? do it anyway for yourself, so... Fucking hell. Never known anyone dislike gardening as that much. That is because... When I was younger, my parents, when they used to punish me, they used to say, get outside and cut that grass. So now you refuse so to do I it as an So now I fucking hate gardening, so I blame them. Carry on. <laughs> so, it, it was a really nice, respectful sort of kid. A lot of children from school don't actually remember him, and his teachers said that he was very reserved and quiet. So, he went on to leave school in 1985, he then served two years in the Army Reserve as a medical and dental assistant. And then in 1987, he enrolled into Morris Brown College in Atlanta. And it was there that Murray formed this £300 a day crack cocaine habit. Fucking hell. It completely took over his life. So all the way up until then, he was a normal functioning, grown adult, going about his life. How things change? Very quickly. So he had formed this really bad habit and it just took over his life. It led him to like um, a few stealing sprees, obviously to feed said habit. And he actually went on this rampage and robbed five shoe shops. He was arrested and he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. What did he steal? Shoes, <laughs> obviously. I can't believe I've just fucking replied. You're a knob. Um... So he was sentenced to 15 years. However, he began writing shitloads of begging letters to judge 
saying that he's been reformed whilst being in there, he's been re rehabilitated, he's clean, um, and that the judge worry his last hope of getting out and having a normal sort of life. So eventually it worked, and in November of 2000, he was paroled and released. He served five years and three months. Which I still think is quite a lot. Like, he must have robbed a lot of fucking shoes for 15 years in prison. It might have been expensive shoes. Could have been. So, he moved in to a house that was owned by his mum. And he got himself a little job. And he tried to keep his head down. But it didn't take long before he got back onto his addiction. And he was using crack cocaine and heroin. It's going to cost even more. So, in July 2001... A lady called Sheila Fields, who was a known sex worker, was walking the streets and at about 3am, a man pulls up and offers a business transaction. What's, she, what are the, what's he buying? Well, I'm guessing she's either going to suck his cock or Carla, touch his balls. Carla, no. Why ask? <sighs> so she gets into his car, not realising that she was going to become one of... Murray Travis's many victims. They go back to his house. They get high together. Murray then takes her downstairs into the basement so they could do the transaction. He decided to shackle her, beat her, torture, rape her and then strangle her to death. He then takes her body naked and dumps it in East St. Louis where she wouldn't be found until July the 31st of 2002. It's not actually known for sure. There's a lot of conflicting information, but Sheila is believed to be the first victim. Even though, like I said, the more I've read, I don't actually think she is. The way he talks about his first curl and the details just don't match. Right. Um, but we'll go back to that later. So all these bodies are beginning to turn up with absolutely no answers and they'd made no connections. The police find themselves in like this massive whirlwind of this murder and rape spree, starting with the body of a Lissa Greenway, who was found in Washington Park on April the 1st. She was naked, beaten and strangled to death with ligature marks around her neck. The only evidence that were collected from that scene were tyre track marks, which were obviously left next to a body. Then, 4th of April, a little way across town, the body of 44-year-old woman was found near death, but she was never able to identify her attacker. She suffered major brain trauma. 15th of May... Did she survive? Yeah, but yeah. she she is yeah. um, brain yeah. damaged due to it. 15th of May, the body of Teresa Wilson is found in West Alton Park, beaten, naked and strangled to death. Strangled to death. <laughs> Again, will it get to march round her neck? Eight days later, 25th of May, the body of a 46-year-old, Betty James, is found in St. Louis, naked, beaten, strangled to death. You're starting to get the picture, aren't you? The only thing that were different was a mark that had been left on a leg and it was another tyre mark but it didn't match the first tyre print from the previous scene right okay so that kind of threw the police a little bit stopping all these dots connecting aren't they 29th of june the body of 36 year old veronica thompson is found in west alton not far like 16 foot away from where Teresa's body were found 25th of August, Yvonne Cruz is found in St. Louis. Now, this time, the police was able to collect a DNA sample of semen. October 8th, the body of 36-year-old Brenda Beasley is found in St. Louis. Again, beaten, strangled, naked. But again, she also had the same DNA. So, to 2002, January 30th, the police find female remains near Highland. Then, 28th of March, again, the fine female remains in Columba District. As you can imagine, police would be on frustrated. All these victims kept turning up. They had no leads whatsoever. All evidence they had just led them to dead ends. 
it's not like anyone's phoned up and said, oh, I've seen this bloke dragging this woman off, or no. I've heard screams from such and such. It's just no. They're just going, and do you know what made it worse? As we know, back then, police really didn't care if sex workers went missing. Well, I think that's a bit unfair to say police didn't. Right. Let me rephrase what I mean. Allegedly, some police officers didn't care about sex workers. Okay, put it like that. (laughs) Who's going to fucking shoot me? Bobby's might be knocking at the door and saying, hey, up. Are you saying all fucking police don't care about sex workers? No, but do you know what I mean? Amount of cases we've seen, it is shitty. Yeah, of course. And a lot of people who are listening will agree with you. Right, so anyway, they had no leads. They had this evidence, the two tyre tracks... Um, and the two samples, but they were, they weren't getting nowhere. There were no links. Around this time, there was a journalist from St. Louis called Bill. I can't. Nobody knows his last name. Like he's completely gone off grid. Um, and I kind of think it might be because of how it affected him. Right. But anyway, so Bill did an article on Teresa Wilson, and he was saying that sex workers need to be seen more than just sex workers. Yeah. When things like this are happening. So... I think the attitude then was, well, they're putting themselves yeah. in harm's way, so... Yeah. So, Bill goes to work and a letter's on his desk and it's dated the 21st of May, 2001. The letter reads, Dear Bill, nice sob story about Teresa Wilson... Write one about Greenway, write a good one, and I'll tell you where many others are to prove that I'm real. Here's directions to number 17. Search in a 50-yard radius from the X. Put the story in the Sunday paper like the last. With this letter was a map marked with an X. Bill thought it could have been fake. So he was going to... Could have been anyone, couldn't it? Could have been anybody. And he was going to throw it away. But he thought, no, I'll hand it in in case it comes to something. And just if it's going to go out, it could go. If he hadn't had done... If he hadn't... That that moment, he had a choice. And he didn't know then how important that choice was going to be. Because... Which is mad, isn't it? It was this that completely blew case open. When the police searched, once they got to the bottom of it, and because obviously you can imagine there's a lot of legwork, they've sent you a map, you've got to figure out where this is from because it wasn't the full map, it was a section of a map. Um, but when they did figure it out and when they got to this place, lo and behold, they found a, vo- a body. So that's when they knew that this guy was... Legit. Legit. Police had to use the map to track down now bearing in mind this is 2000 so and i know it's not light years away but even in the short time of how much things have advanced so the police had to take this map and figure out where it was printed from eventually they worked it out that it had been printed via expedia so the police worked with microsoft they ended up tracing the IP address for all homes within a certain radius that I downloaded said map. I had a case uh, not that uh, like that not long back on one of my uh, old ones where they'd worked with um, I can't remember who they worked with but they worked with someone yeah and that's how they located them so that's have even been last podcast I don't know but go on yeah so this is how they were managed to trace Mary Troy Travis. On the 7th of June 2002, officers turned up to his house and knocked on door. <laughs> Mary answered door in his underwear saying, it's 7am, why are you knocking on me door? Police basically said, you know why we're here. And Mary nods and says, come in. So straight away, the police noticed that the computer's in corner at room it didn't take long. They had a quick look. There were saved drafts on there from the letter he sent. Um, more copies of the maps that he'd sent. Just bits laying about. There were receipts. Um, when looking inside filing cabinet, they then find his kit bag. And it contained duct tape, 
straps, stockings and gloves. The police then went down to the basement and this is where they realised exactly what kind of person that Murray was. Oh, he's not a fucking person. This man had turned his basement into a torture chamber. I can imagine. Now, what I have read on a more psychological side of this is the police could, and anyone that's looked in this into this case, any professionals, the difference in how his home was to the outside. So when police got there, everything was immaculate. It was clean. That it won't, you know, it won't like a man lived there. It was really tidy. But then as soon as they went into this basement, it was like it were two people. A Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. This basement. He's got, he's got his normal world. Yeah. And then he's got his other world where he can fucking do his sick, sick. fantasies. Yeah. Now, it were covered in blood. The walls, the floor, ceiling, furniture, it was soaked. They were even finding blood under layers of paint. So what he'd do is he'd just paint over the top of it and then when it got covered again, paint it again. After testing the blood that they could, it were linked to six of his victims that had been found. The police also found torture devices, including stun guns, and then they come across this massive collection of homemade videotapes. So, just before you go on, stun gun. Yep. So, he obviously kidnaps them. So... I think... That must have been one of the things that he had used or did use. I think what he's done is he's got them back to his home with the ho- with, with the you know intention of Having exchanging favours. Yeah. yeah. They get high or whatever... Then it has advantage. Yep, and then they don't leave. Well, they do when he carries them out, but that's a different... So, anyway, they found these videotapes and all these tapes were him raping, torturing, strangling, just everything he did, he had documented and kept his videos. Now, all those videos are on the internet for you to watch. I wouldn't advise it. I'm so- yes. I'm sorry. They're out there. You can watch them. I wouldn't advise it. Right. Um, no. Not for me. I had, I watched. I, that shouldn't. Oh, it's just fucking sick. But go on. So I did see a clip of one, but I watched it intentionally because it was regarding, you know, the first murder. Because on this tape, he says my first kill what's your name you can hear a lady muttering and he says in fact i don't give a fuck um and she's strapped up shackled blindfolded just yeah so i've watched a tiny bit of one i won't go on to watch any others but they're out there like we've got we've got loads of different kinds of murderers people who just straight kill People, people. Some people that are born evil. Some people that were always going to go on to do awful things. No, but what I mean is they all have different methods and different things that they do. Yeah. But the blokes that torture people. That's a I, different level, isn't it? Yeah. Because exactly you're wanting to, you, you are inflicting pain on purpose to get pleasure. Yes, but you're doing it over a length of time. Yeah, it's not a quick. Yeah, which makes it all the more fucking creepy because immediately when i hear about people torturing people for sexual fantasy i always think about david parker ray yeah if you haven't heard of david parker ray google him (laughs) so all the police officers that were involved within this case and people that had had to watch these videos that had seen bits had all ended up in intensive therapy so I'll leave it at that, you can imagine. Just another side note, I know this is probably annoying, but I think I told you, allegedly, I don't know if this is a thousand percent true, but as someone who worked on the David Park, uh, David Parker Ray case... Yes, she... Um, inside his uh, torture toy- chamber, apparently committed suicide because of all the horrible fucking things that she'd seen. Yeah. Which I can imagine. Well, 
Yeah. I, we've watched stuff and it's hard, I, you know. I struggle to sleep at night as it fucking is, but there's, I'd have fucking no chance. No. So the police also found um, a blueprint plan that had been put in for his basement and this was to create a bigger place. It had got holding uh, cells. He'd got builders bidding to come and do this. So they'd seen, you know, we're all going to go through. He obviously had no intention of stopping. He were going to carry on until, for as long as he got away with it. So the police then also find two cars that belonged to him at his home, which both matched the two separate... They had him to bank, they had him bank to rights. They knew it were him. There were no way he were going to get out of it. He was arrested and he was questioned. And the police describe him as pure evil. He wanted to be in control of... We've, again, we've watched stuff in you see interviews. Some people just completely crumble and they blur everything out. And you see some just being cocky little bastards. And this is exactly what he was like. It had to be him in charge. They asked him a question. He returned with another question. Well, he's not going to be submissive, is he? Because no. he obviously likes fucking dominating and all the power. Yeah. So he's, he's definitely going to be like that, isn't he? Yeah. So the police knew that throughout these interviews and the way he was behaving, they knew that the, there were still more victims to find. They obviously wanted him to talk. So <laughs> Mary even offered, I'll take you to these locations. They set it all up with a police escort. They drove about an hour and he went, oh no, I've changed my mind. No comment. So then he was still in control. Mm -hmm. You're going to take me back. Um... At some point during interviewing, uh, Mary had asked for a drink and that's how they obtained his DNA. Clearly it were a match. So, the police obviously decide um, he's getting charged with this murder and we're going to detain him. But the police decide that he needs detaining on suicide watch because of some of the things that he's saying. He kept saying he couldn't go back to prison. Um, there's no way he's doing it. So, on this ward, on this wing, sorry, of suicide watch... There's meant to be 15 minute checks. Yeah. Four checks per hour. Now, for some reason, they missed two consecutive checks and Mary was then found dead in the showers. So, he was arrested on June the 7th and he was found dead on June the 10th. He was never able to... So, I'm assuming he committed suicide. Yeah. He wasn't killed in the shop. No, no, no. No, he committed suicide. He used... Um, he basically ripped his sheet. Yeah. And hung himself. So, all these victims, all these families, some have still never been found, and they will never get any answers. Unbelievable. He'll never have to explain why he did it. And he took, he took it to his grave, didn't he? Yeah, 100%. Took it to his grave. There's tapes of women that have still never been identified there's remains that have been found that have still never been identified and the police believe that he's got at least 20 victims Fucking hell. so but that's obviously using the tapes and stuff yeah um but yeah he'll never have to answer for anything and as I started this and I said you know that that lady had fucking moved into her house and she sat and her mate's like oh put this on it was his mum that still owned the house and she'd obviously rented it. So when she discovered that this is where he'd killed people, she, she, what, well, how, I want to get out. But Travis's mum went, no, you signed your lease. So it ended up going through a big court thing. She has eventually ended a lease for her, but. I think so. Yeah, she was refusing. She Fuck said that yeah. she had, she had, she didn't need to by law disclose that it had been used for multiple, multiple murders. So, there you go. Mary Troy Travis. Right, so my case this time is about the murder of a young lad called Chris Donald. We start in a place called Pollock Shields in Glasgow, Scotland. Now, Pollock Shields is renowned for being a little bit rough, route edges, let's say. It's got gangs, mainly teenagers, in the 20s, stuff like that. Often referred to as young teams, firms. So they go into other areas, fight the gangs, you know how it is. Yep. Knives, bricks, bottles, 
of course it's all about reputation and loss of face and sometimes majority of the time maybe or maybe not they go on to other crimes now in the late 1990s there was a notorious gang called the shielders now pollock, pollock shields is mainly a white asian community okay so this gang called the shielders first member is imran shaheed now he's top boy yeah he's top man um he's got dyed blonde shaved hair is absolutely massive massive like a proper gym goer right. really well stocky and he was nicknamed baldy he spent time in jail in mid 90s for attempted murder he was known about previously give a man brain damage with a baseball bat just someone that people don't fucking mess with chopped off fingers of rivals yeah. Now, he had a younger brother called Zishan, and he was basically second in command. His nickname was Crazy. Okay. Also, been in a lot of bother, had done 30 months for road rage, with which included trying to run over a woman. Nice. Even though Imran Shaheed had moved away from Pollock Shields, he still had a name there. He was still feared there. Yeah. So March 15th, 2004, James Wallace and his best mate, Chris Donald, wasn't at school that day. Okay. They purchased a new computer game and they were going home to play on it. Smoking as a, a spliff as they walked, enjoying themselves. So Chris and James are walking down the street and a silver, silver Mercedes pulls up and Crazy, which is the She's, second in command, yeah. 28 years old at this time, was driving and a lad called Danish Saheed was in the passenger seat, 22 years old. James and Chris actually crossed the street to try and avoid him. This guy called Baldy allegedly said, I'm doing him. Chris was thrown into the rear footwell of the, this car as he's holding onto this door frame while they're trying to drag him into this mm. car. Tried to defend himself. James runs off. He's, he, he doesn't escape, but he gets out of the situation. Right. Whereas Chris gets grabbed, trying to defend himself against this fucking big bloke but, yeah, called the... Baldy. He's a 15-year-old boy. He's not going to stand a chance, is yeah. he? James said that he could hear Chris screaming, I'm only 15. What did I do? And this Baldy was saying, I'm Baldy. Nobody fucks with me. And said to James, shouted to James, I think he must have been across the street. Or, yeah. You're next, and you're going to know what pain feels like. But I've got a quick interview with James. Okay. That I can play it now. He's attacked and kidnapped by five Asian men. His friend, Jamie Wallace, was with him. He said, I'm only 15, I'm only 15. And they, they said, do you know what pain is? You're next. And they were saying about me, I was next. And then after that, I seen him getting dragged into the car, head first. And the two doors slammed and they sat on him and they started punching into him. So in this car, there's five people, including Chris. So we've got... Baldy and Crazy, the two so, brothers. Yeah. We've got Danish Saheed, Mohammed Mustak, and Zahid Mohammed. Now, Zahid Mohammed would actually go on to give evidence for the Crown in this case. Oh, against them? Yeah. Right. So, we'll fast forward a little bit to where he gives evidence. Zahid Mohammed told the jury that the night before all this happened, mm. in a nightclub... Baldy got attacked. Right. And he got bottled. So outside his nightclub. Right. So he's on rampage. Nobody fucks with him. He wanted revenge. It didn't matter who it was, somebody were gonna fucking pay. He said that he wanted to find who it was and chop them up, take their eyes out. Nice. So they obviously picked up a car and went to look for him. They had a feeling that it was 
a rival gang called the McCulloch Street Boys. But Baldy wanted to find out which white bastards had hurt his precious pride. Right. Now, I've actually got a side note here saying SDS, small dick syndrome. <laughs> Is that what you put aside? <laughs> Look there. You are a wally. So, when they asked Saheed, you know, who, who were you looking for? Yeah. He, he actually said, anybody. Yeah, he said, like you've just said, you hit nail on Ed. Somebody's hurt his pride, his lost face, and he were out to fucking... As long as word got out that he'd done this, he didn't care who were going to get hurt. Yeah. So, there was actually a few witnesses for this. Because Chris Donald's mum actually reported the crime at 3.28pm. So that were after. Yeah. So it's in middle of the afternoon when yeah. this is happening. It's, it's broad daytime, daylight. yeah. So in this car, Chris was continuously attacked, asked about this nightclub, had a knife pushed against his back. Allegedly, they showed him a blue bag, which were outline of a gun. Right. You know, threatening him. In this time... In the car, this gang met multiple phone calls and they're looking for somewhere to take Chris to torture him so they can get these answers about who's fucking attacked Baldy. Right. Now, one of the gang members, Saheed Mohammed, got let out of the car in Strathclyde at 4pm because he had to be home for his 6pm tag. (laughs) So, the cell site... (laughs) The cell site tracked this uh, car journey. Yeah. Driving to Dundee. 100 mile round trip. In this time, they'd stopped and picked up a can of petrol. Allegedly, they made over 200 phone calls. A lot of activity. Eventually, they drove back to Glasgow because someone had suggested the Clyde walkway was a quiet spot useful for sorting someone out. And it is near Celtic Park. The football ground. Right. Chris was then dragged from the car, stabbed in his front and his back. He suffered major organ trauma in his chest, in his abdomen. Chris also had no defensive wounds, which implies that he was held. Yeah. As Chris is slumped against the trunk of a tree, losing blood, they then pour petrol all over his body, flicked a match and left. Horrible bastards. Chris then attempted to roll in a puddle to put out this fire. His body was 70% covered in burns. And Chris died right there in a mortal puddle, bleeding and burning. And Chris remained there until he was found the next morning. (laughs) At 8pm that night, people phoned the police regarding a vehicle had been set on fire west end of Glasgow. So the story continues. Later that night, clothes from this attack was also burned in an alley. So this wreckage of this car had vital forensic evidence. Of course it did. Because the fire... Chris is going to have no evidence on him. Because the fire service had been phoned quite soon, the fire service had got there quite quick and managed to put it out. So there was still evidence in the car. Oh, fucking hell. There was actually traces of Chris's blood. Um, there were one of his trainers um, that were believed to have been his. And there was also Imran Shahid's leather jacket. At some point after this, Baldy, his younger brother, and Mohammed Mushtaq all fled to Pakistan because they have family there. And as it stood, there was no extradition treaties. Chris had been found by a cyclist the next day. Investigators worked out he was alive when set alight because the place, um, it were like a slope and the attack started at the top of the slope. Yeah. And it ended at the bottom as he tried to put himself out. So yeah. he'd moved. Yeah. Celtic and Rangers are obviously... Very vicious rivals. Where this had happened, it were completely covered in Celtic and Rangers scarves. Everyone was appalled. There were flowers from the largest mosque in Glasgow. They were distraught at what yeah. had happened. 
this is obviously after. So we've got six witnesses, but they all refuse to do written statements. And that's because of who it is. People were keeping quiet and were scared. Now, there's, there were a lot of racism involved in this case, which I don't like to go too much into because obviously racism, racism is fucking awful. But I also don't want to give people that don't deserve to be spoke about. Yeah. Be spoke about. But there were a load of media surrounding this case. British Na- National Party got involved. They jumped all over it. Yeah. So March 19th, which is four days after, Baldy's name was getting linked. His name kept coming up. And April 2nd, 2004, police got a breakthrough, which were two and a half week after. They got three arrest warrants. One was for Danish Saheed, which was the passenger in the car. Yeah. One was Saheed Mohammed, which was the kid who went home early. And they never found out the name of the third arrest warrant, but they're assuming it was one of the blokes who had fled to Pakistan. Danish Saheed was charged with murder, and Saheed Mohammed was charged with abduction. Now, the three blokes in Pakistan, there were a lot of panic that it would be unlikely that they get to face justice. However, Scotland's first Muslim MP, who was born in Pakistan, Mohammed Sawar, in central Glasgow, played a really big role in bringing these three blokes to justice, and he was also backed up by the Foreign Secretary, then Jack Straw. So, Danish Saheed, which was the passenger, Mm -hmm. went on to get 17 years, and Saheed Mohammed, who was the one who went home early, went on to get five years. As for the three... Main culprits. Yeah. So, the the judge, Lord Oost, that's how you say it, told Imran Shaheed, 29, his brother Shiham, 28, and Mohammed Mushtaq, 27, that their premeditated, cold-blooded execution truly was an abomination. As he sentenced the men to minimum sentences of 25 years, 22 years and 23 years. As this were read out, it said that Chris's mother, Angela, shouted out, you bastards. Just before I finish, there's not much on Chris as a young lad, but it said that he were an happy-go-lucky lad. He had younger sisters, were a good big brother, just a normal lad. He, he obviously was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he, he suffered awful, awful consequences, didn't he? Yeah. Now, just awful. there's a, a band called Glas Vegas, who I'm assuming are from Glasgow, and they actually wrote a song about this called Flowers and Football Tops, and apparently it's from the point of view of his father. Oh, interesting. So, if you want to check that out, go check that out. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot more information on these blokes after this case, because they haven't really behaved themselves since. Well, but I can imagine someone I, like someone like Baldy, right, is not the kind of person that even inside prison is going to lose fucking face. Yeah. Well, so, you, you won't be surprised when you when you Google it and you find out what they've been up to. But I don't even want to give them any more fucking time. Time, because no. That poor young lad got dragged into a fucking car. He was 15 year old. Yeah. He did fuck all wrong, just that, walking that, down the street. That's like someone doing it to our Joey. Yeah, our son been out there with his yeah, mates. Yeah, our son's 14. That's like someone doing it to our Joey. Just been in wrong place in wrong time. It's fucking horrific. And then to set him on fire while still alive. Yeah. That is some evil shit. But fucking mad props to these people in Glasgow that all came together. Together and to get even these, get them brought get these back. bastards from Pakistan because that, yeah. that won't have been easy whatsoever. The amount of fucking hoops that they must have jumped oh, through. Yeah. Be- yeah, that wasn't an easy thing to do. So that's the murder of Chris Donald. Oh, poor kid. So that's uh, that's us. We hope you've enjoyed it. Hopefully we get next one out to you in the next two 
to three weeks. <laughs> no, we we're gonna try. We say it all the time, but but please believe that we we are coming from a genuine. Oh yeah, like we will never stop doing this, no matter how much life gets in way, yeah. and no matter how long. Like we're not in it for lies, you know. We're just this fucking windy cleaner and carer from Yorkshire. <laughs> they just like to talk true crime and chat You know, shit. I hardly talk to people when I go out of fucking house. Hardly. <laughs> hardly. <laughs> but talk, that's I, laughable. For I anyone talk, that knows you... I talk more on this than I'll probably do. Doing his life. Honestly. So we're going to go chill out. Hopefully Leeds United win tomorrow because <laughs> they've been on an awful run. We've just sat as manager... Thanks. Really upset about it. And I've been kicking Carla's ass at Go Fish. No, right. So, so I discovered... We'll, we'll end on that. No, you're wanting to end on that because you know what you've done. We'll end on that. Yeah, all right. Fucking Go Fish. What has our life become? We're fucking sad. Anyway, have a nice one and we will see you soon. See ya.